Well, here we are in Matthew, the second chapter. It's the story of the Magi. The English word Magi, M-A-G-I, uh, comes from the Greek word. Uh, in the Greek, because it's plural, M-I-G-I is plural. Uh, in the Greek language, that's, it's spelled M-A-G-O-I. And uh, when they came into the English, they dropped the O, kept the I, but it is plural. There were, we don't know how many. You know, uh, these are what many in the church have called the wise men. And certainly they were that. These are the wise men from the East. Uh, we have even Christmas songs about the, th the three kings of Ori and Ah. But there, there's no indication there was three. There's an indication there was a large caravan. And you say, well, where did the number three come up with? Apparently from the treasures, the three treasures. But this was a representative group of uh, a priestly caste of, of uh, wise men from the east. They were called the Magi. And uh, it is a very old fraternity of wise men. And you'll be surprised to know some of the people that were involved in this. This group of people go all the way back to Egypt. And then we, and we don't see them again until we get into um, Mesopotamia. And boy, the history of these people from Mesopotamia takes us all the way to the Roman Empire. We meet this group of people in Egypt in the time of Joseph, and Joseph became part of this group. He was an interpreter of dreams. God gave him that gift. And there was already a group that were engaged in that type of thing, of interpreting dreams, um, celestial order, orders, and such as that. And uh, then they, we don't meet this group of, of, with any significance until we get into the time of Moses and we meet this group again. We meet them by a representative out of the Mesopotamia, out of the land of Abraham with Balaam. And uh, then, of course, Daniel becomes part of this group in the Babylonian captivity. In fact, the book of Daniel says that Daniel was considered ten times wiser than the wisest wise man. We'll talk about that today as well. And Daniel tells him the reason that is is because he is under the office of the God of the heavens, the God of the creator, the creator God. Uh, while most of these people were polytheistic, he was monotheistic and a true believer in Christ. Well, this is the Magi. They have quite a history. They have quite a history. Not only were they diviners or uh, astrologers or stuff as that nature, but they were also all, also very educated in um, engineering, in science, in literature, in theology. Uh, they were quite a. That's why in the English we try to figure out what what are, how can we define these people? And we call them the wise men. We call them wise men. They they were among the wisest of the nations in which they. And here's the interesting thing to me about the Magi, and then we're going to have a word of prayer in a moment. This group of people outlasted some of the most powerful nations in the world. The Egyptian civilization, uh, Assyrian, Babylonian, Persians, Greeks, Romans. This group of people. They just outlived everybody, and when one nation went down, they just moved their operation to another nation and were received. It's just an interesting group of people. The nearest thing to that today is the church of Jesus Christ that does the same thing. And, and truly, we are the great wise men of the world as far as Scripture. So 
it's an interesting group, and I want to talk a little bit about that, what we've been doing in my Christmas series uh, of three lessons. It came from a question Jane asked me one day that somebody had, she had seen ask that question on television, uh, what, was, what was the first Christmas gift? And, uh, you know, the world is puzzled about that. But Christians, they know right away that it's Jesus Christ. Well, we talked about that a little while, and then I couldn't leave it alone. I just went away. I mean, that's a simple answer. It's a true answer, and I just walked away from it. and Couldn't get away from it. And I got the idea that, listen, that gift becomes special to whom it's given. And there's always something special, not, not just Jesus Christ alone, but part of the package that comes with him to your life. And so I... I took this idea and I developed three, three messages. You could do a whole lot more apparently, but that was my time, about to whom this gift was given and what, how it, that gift of Jesus Christ was wrapped according to their life. And for example, we, uh, we studied Mary. I, I think I put on your paper, uh, this gift was given to Mary and for her it was wrapped in a miraculous motherhood. That was special to Mary, not to anybody else. Her special gift from Jesus Christ, but from receiving him, the greatest gift that she had was this miracle motherhood. Well, when we came to the temple shepherd, we found that the greatest gift of Jesus Christ to them was the Lamb of God, born in their stable uh, and, and, and birthed in their, their manger business uh, of uh, the priesthood. Well, today we're going to look at the Magi, and I want, you to, I want you to see that the, the gift of Jesus Christ in their life was the gift of worship. The gift of worship. And I hope that we're going to be able to see how that gift of worship, how important that gift of worship, and how it changed their thinking about worship in our lesson today, the gift of worship. Well, let's have a word of prayer, give you a moment to... If you're visiting with us by the internet, this gives you an opportunity to, you know, cut off your cell phones like the rest of us and focus for the next hour or so on this study of the gift of worship at Christmas. And then the second thing is to be sure that you're under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You cannot learn the Bible, even as a Christian in carnality. The identity of carnality in your life is sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. They have to be confessed in order for the Holy Spirit to teach you the truth. It is a spiritual book. It is studied by spiritual people to get spiritual messages from God. And that's exactly how it works, and it works under the Holy Spirit. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a procedure that must be done in order for you to get spiritual information. Let us pray. I give you that moment of silence through your priesthood of 1 Peter 2 to confess that sin. This is not for salvation. This is for sanctification. This is for the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit to teach you truth. Well, Father, we are thankful for each that's come our way, both by automobile today as well as the Internet. Uh, both are just wonderful gifts from you, Father, and we're thankful, Father, to be able to use them in the kingdom's work. I pray today, Father, as we look at this Christmas special to the Magi, the word worship is used in such a unique way in their lives. They came to worship, and they had an, a concept of that in verse 2. But by the time they actually got to the Christ child, and saw the reality of it in their life, that word changed dramatically and their life with it. So we pray we would have a look at this word, worship, today, and understand its true meaning and the exercise in our life in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in my introduction, we already have discussed this. We want to take a look at our passage under point one. We're going to go through 12 verses, and I want to break it into three parts with the idea of worship. 
We're going to find this word worship in verse 2. Here's how it reads. Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. This is really important. Listen, see that little phrase, in the days of Herod? Let me tell you something important about this. The word I-N, the word in the English in, in the Greek is E-N. But in this case, now listen to me, in this case, it's N plus the locative of historical time. In other words, Luke is dating the birth time of Jesus Christ. Here's what we know for sure. And this is what Luke is saying, N plus the locative of historical timing. Luke is saying that Jesus Christ was born during the days of Herod the king, and the Magi visited him, the Christ out of the east from Mesopotamia. They traveled from Mesopotamia. We're talking about a long trip. We're talking weeks in a caravan, maybe a month to get there. And so I, I, want, I want you to understand that. And this word, in the days of Herod, is a, is a, a biblical dating of the time of Christ. Now, we know this for sure. We know Herod, this, the king, this was called Herod the Great. We know that he reigned from 37 to, to 4 B.C. I mean, that's locked into history. We also know a second thing about him. We know that Herod the Great died on the 4th of B.C. before Passover. Now, let me tell you why people get all messed up with the dating of the birth of Christ. Listen to me now. They don't know the Jewish calendar. Because the first of the year in the Jewish calendar is Passover. That's March, April. In the Jewish calendar, that falls in March, April. Why is that important? Historians say that King Herod died in 4 B.C. before Passover. If he had died after Passover, it wouldn't have been 4. It would have been 3. Right? Moves down. Now listen to me why this is important. In verse 5, when we, when we come on down, now let me just read, and I'll get to verse 5, and I'm going to, I'm going to pick this idea back up. He's born in the days of Herod the king. Behold, Magi came from the east. We know Mesopotamia. We know this. I'm not guessing this. We know this. From the east arrived in Jerusalem, and here's what they ask. And listen, and they got right into the king, which was, I mean, he was not eating a fruitcake at Christmas. And they were able to get right into him. I mean, they got escorted into him. Nobody got into his city and out of his city unless it was a God thing without Herod knowing it. So when they get there, they, they, come, to, they, come, to, they come to Israel because they're looking for the king of the Jews. They saw his star. The second thing, they came to Jerusalem. They didn't go to Bethlehem because they didn't know the scriptures connected with his birthplace. They came to Jerusalem, the capital of the city, and talked to the king. And their question to him was, where, not when? His question to them is when, in verse 5. And that's very important to the dating. Now, it goes on. Where is he who was born king of the Jews, which is a Gentile term? Israel never called their Messiah uh, king of the Jews. That's a slang term. That's a Gentile term in knowledge. I mean, they would talk about the, the king of Judah, the king of David. They would talk in whole different terms. Where is, where, that's important, where is he who has been born? That's an absolute, there's no doubt in their mind, king of the Jews. For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. 
Now, that's a, they have a concept of worship that they brought with them like most of us. And listen, a personal experience with the truth of God's word in the person of Jesus Christ will change your idea of worship. It did there as verse 11. When Herod the king heard it, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Right? Listen, let me, let me bring it to your household. If one of the parents gets nuttier than a fruitcake, if the least little thing bends them out of shape and they just go, eh, and we call it everybody else has to walk in eggshells, don't know about that household or what? All right. Well, you're lucky if you don't know about that household. But let me tell you, every child in that home knows when that parent loses its cool, gets out of where it is, the whole household gets troubled. Come on now. Do you understand that? That's who Herod was as a king. When he got bent out, he made sure everybody got bent out. And as, as once you was under his rule a while, when he got bent out, everybody got bent out before it got to him. That's what that means. Just thought I'd try to make it personal so you could understand it. So Herod, he gathers all the chief priests and scribes of the people. That's the top. That's the top knowers. That's his wise men. That's his wise men. And he began to inquire of them where Christ was to be born. They said to him in Bethlehem of Judea, they went right to Micah 5.2 and quote it. You, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. And watch this. And out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. A ruler. A ruler. See, that's what the Magi saw. They didn't know where. They saw his star and knew he had been born. They didn't know where. So they came to the capital to find out where, for certainly the White House ought to know. Herod secretly called the Magi into a private, in other words, he called them into a private hearing, a private, not an open forum, a private forum. Herod secretly called the Magi into a private meeting with the king. That would be only his very top elite people with him. And asserted from them, listen to this, the time the star appeared. He wants to know. They said, oh, he's born. <laughs> he's here. We just want to know where. Herod says, where? The guys say, Bethlehem. Herod calls him back in and says, when? Why is that important to him? Why is that important? Let's pause a moment. Let's drop down to verse 16. This is why it's important. I can't tell you why, why, how important this is. Herod's, when Herod saw that, th the, that he had been tricked by the Magi because they, God had appeared to them after they worshipped the Christ child, Jesus, king of the Jews, the Lord told them, don't tell Herod Get out of town and don't tell Herod. You know why? Hmm. He's not eating a fruitcake at Christmas. That's why. He became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem. Now watch this because it's based on the timing he got from the Magi. And like everything else Herod does, he goes extreme. Watch this now. All the male ch children in Bethlehem in and in all its vicinity or region, from two years old and under. Now let me tell you, we got a picture that's very clear. 
We know that Jesus was born between 6 and, and 4 B.C. You just count back two years. Boom, boom, boom. We also know this. Based on that timing, Jesus is older than one. If he had been less than one, Herod would have cut it off at one. Listen, this is not popular. This is not popular what he's about to do. But listen, he don't care because he's not earning a fruitcake. I should have called that, should have been my sermon today, shouldn't it? Listen, he doesn't care because he just killed a bunch of people. Listen, it was already said of him, you were better off to, to be a pig, to be a pet that belonged to him, than a child that he had. You were better off, you were better off being a pet to him than a, than a, a, a son. I mean, if you bounced the wall off the wall and he told you not to do it again, if you did it again, he'd just kill you. I mean, it was not, not even a... Well, so he goes out and he murders all of them. Listen, we know that Jesus is older than one, somewhere after one and before two. That's for sure. He's not over two, and he, he's he's and he's over one. We we see how his we see how how his math is working off from the time, and so he he knows it's old. He's older than a year. I don't know. He's not two. So I'll just kill everybody under two and get it done. Therefore, we know Jesus was born in 5 B.C. In the days of Herod. And listen, when he kills those children, all the Jews believe he died a terrible death and they believe that God put him under the discipline for doing that. He died a terrible death. Well, anyhow, back to my study. So we see the Magi, they come into town, verses 1 and 2. Uh, the star to the Gentiles. This was star to, the star to the Gentiles. These are Gentiles. Uh, and then we see uh, Micah. Micah becomes important. The scriptures to the Jews. I mean, when they wanted to know, the Magi didn't know. They just knew the star was punched out and... They knew that that king of the Jews. Now, how in the world did they ever put that together? Oh, that's a wonderful story. And they come to they come to worship him because they know this is not just any king. This is a special king because that's a special star of a special king. So they they show up, and so now we have in verses three through eight we have Herod, we have Israel, not the Gentiles. We have Israel. We have Israel, and they go to the Scriptures. Listen, John 5, 39 and 40 really tell the story. Jesus says, here, here is my people, the Israelites. They're constantly searching the Scriptures to find eternal life. They throw me under the bus, and I'm the only guy with eternal life. That, that, that's my paraphrasing. They search the Scripture to find eternal life. They reject me, who is the only way to eternal life. And that, was, that was certainly them here today. They know exactly where he's going to be born. And Herod believes that he was born because he's going to kill all the children two and under to get them. And had the Magi not gone back, he might have got them. And God said to the Magi, sneak out of town. Don't come in like you, don't go out the way you came in. And so in verses 9 through 12, and having heard the king, they went their way, and lo, the star reappeared and went on before them, led them, led them right to the house, not to the manger. This is not where he was born. This is where he came back to. They came back to a house. And they, they went in and... Uh, the star stood over the, uh, stood over the house, and they went in, and they saw the star. Listen to this. When they saw the star reappear, listen to how this affected them. Be, and it affected them because of the anticipation, the expectation of the worship, which was the reason they came. Agreed? They came to worship. 
this king that had a special star assigned to him. And when they saw that star reappear, I mean, they got a road map out looking for Bethlehem. You understand? They got a road map out looking for Bethlehem. They got a road map out looking for Bethlehem. They can't find. So the star reappears, and when they saw the star, they rejoiced. Watch that. They didn't just rejoice. They Listen to this. It knocked their socks off. It says they rejoiced exceedingly. Exceedingly. Listen, and not only that, not only, listen, they rejoiced exceedingly, knocked their socks off with great joy. I mean, they're high-fying. They're doing the, the whole bit, aren't they? And you know where that's coming from? Listen to me. I can't tell you how important this is. Their hearts. Their hearts are filled with the joy of the expectation of being able to worship the king of the Jews that had a special star assigned to him. And, they, and so it goes, and they came into the house, saw the child with Mary's mother. They fell down and worshiped him and opened their treasures. And it tells the treasures, listen, these are the treasures that had been stolen out of the temple that are representative of all the things that they've come to worship about him. I'll show you some of it in a little bit. Listen, if, I don't get it, if you don't get anything else from me today, get this. You've got to open your hearts before you open your treasures to Jesus Christ. The church has got this all backwards. They think if they open their treasures to Jesus, somehow he'll open their hearts, and they've got all that backwards. Or if they'll give their treasures, somehow it'll open God's heart towards them. They got that all wrong. Listen, they opened their hearts before they ever opened their treasures. Their heart was already rejoicing exceedingly with great joy in anticipation. When they came in and saw the Christ child, they bowed down and worshipped him, then opened their treasures. These treasures that had been taken by Babylon who just raped the temple. They brought some of it back home. I don't know what you think about the gold, but I can tell you about what some of the gold was in there. If you'll listen closely, you'll get some of it today. And so the Magi, who is this Magi? Well, they're the Medo Persians, uh, priestly caste. They are part of the long biblical history with this special star. Today I'm going to tell you all about that special star. I'm going to tell you that these Magi formed up five classes of the intellect of the day, and they have a long history. And when one nation went down, they just traveled and went to another one. They set up shops someplace else. They survived. I'm telling you, this fraternity of people survived many powerful kingdoms. And I listed a bunch of them. See the last one, the Kazdim? See, that's a word that means the Ur of the Chaldees. That, that word means the Ur of the Chaldees. And do you know why that is there? Because there was a group that Abraham was a part of. Abraham was a part of. In Joshua 24, 2, he came out of the worship of this group. He came out of the worship of that pagan idea. Got saved by God, went into the mission work. Became a missionary out of the Ur of the... He was called... Listen to me. You don't realize when it says he was called from the Ur of the Chaldees. That's the word. Now, let me tell you a little bit. And listen why that's important. Because the Ur of the Chaldees in Mesopotamia, Abraham was a Shemite who in his history, these people are called uh, Samaritans historically. 
mean, there's such a history behind this. I wish I had time to explain it all. Let me tell you three things about this special star that the Magi had connection to. There are three things. For example, th th this is originally it was called Jacob's star because out of, out of Jacob and Judah would come a special ruler. We just read that out of Micah. But that comes all the way back. Listen, that goes all the way back to Genesis 49.10. It's on your paper. Listen, Jacob's star is introduced to this group by one of their leading guys, a guy called Balaam. Balaam, in Numbers 24.17, this star is called the star of Jacob. This is what they're talking about in Matthew 2. This, this star becomes the star of Jacob to the Magi become the star of the Jews, the king of the Jews. That star is now called, it's moved from Jacob's star to the star of the king of the, the, king of the Jews star. Agreed? Where, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Th that's at Matthew. That comes out of Daniel. That idea comes out of Daniel. And then when they show up, this star becomes the star of Jesus Christ because now they have a name with the king. It's no longer the king star. It's now the star of Jesus Christ. Come on now. Hoo -ah. I mean, this is, listen to me. I don't know about you, but for the Adama family, this is why we put a star in the top of our Christmas tree. In fact, we have two Christmas trees. One for Jane, no. One for children and one for adults. We put a star on the top of it. That's why we put the star up there, because we know who the star is. We know who the star is, maybe. We know who the star is, right? That's why I want a star on top of my Christmas tree. We put lights on it. We put lights all over that thing. We load our Christmas trees up with light. You know why? Because we are the lights of the star. We put lights all over our Christmas trees. Because, listen, this person has become the light of the world, and my union with him has made me a light to the world. We put gifts under the tree because, listen, the greatest gift is the one that the star became the Savior. We put gifts under the tree. We've given because God gave us the greatest of all gifts, the gift of grace, salvation, and all the gifts that are under the tree are not earned nor deserved. They're given by grace. And that's the way we celebrate Christmas in the Adama home. And we do it because of this kind of biblical information in our souls. This is why we make this a special tree. This is why we make it a special event. This is why we worship what that represents, the person of Jesus Christ in his great work. That's the Adama household. We find it to be a festive time. We hope that we can come and sit together and, and rejoice exceedingly with great joy because we too have found Jacob's star, the king of the Jews, is the person of Jesus Christ who came not to rule but to save. The second thing I'd like to mention to you today is this Greek word for worship. It's made up of two words. It has the preposition pros on the front of it, P-R-O-S, means face to face, means to two, but when it's attached to something like this, and, and uh, uh, kuneo, pros kuneo, kuneo means to kiss. <laughs> And that's the best way to kiss is face to face, right? I'm just saying. Now, in the ancient world, it wasn't necessarily on your lips, right? You've seen them do the cheek thing on each side and all that. But what it did show was an affection connection, an affectionate connection to somebody. 
Now, in America, we hug. If we shake hands, we're at distance. I might like you, I might not. We're, we're, in, we're in a guest period. We shake hands or we nod, or, but we keep our distance. But when there's affection, connection. And I don't, I don't mean, I'm not talking sexual or anything like that. I'm, just, I'm talking about affection of whatever. There's a, we, 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 we gap that, we take that gap out. We, we make it personal. And so this word is used that way. It, it means to, uh, to kiss face to face or, or to have an affectionate connection. This word means to bow in respect and honor of a position of authority, divinely de delegated authority, if you're a believer, and it means to worship. There's a difference between bowing down in respect and to truly worship. So let me go back and call your attention to something in verse 11 that you missed because you didn't understand the word, I suppose. Watch what they did when they came. Now, before, listen, their hearts are, are bursting, right, before they ever get in the house. They saw the star. The star stops over the house. I mean, they about exploded. They go in the house and watch what they did. They bowed down, right? They bowed down. They fell down before them. They bowed down and worshiped. So you could bow down to somebody, show respect and honor, and not worship them. See, their whole concept of worship changed when they actually met personally the person. And this is a baby this is a baby. This is a one, a little over a one-year-old child, somewhere between one and one and a half-year-old child that we've got here. And they just, you know why? It's because, of the, it's because of the truth of the history that has brought them to this moment in their life. For example, in Matthew, the 18th chapter, on your own, you can read this parable, but in verse 26 and 22nd, 26, 27, you have the concept of bowing down to delegated divine authority. It's bow down. It's in the human realm. But listen to me. When you get to Matthew, the fourth chapter, and verses 8 and 10, and you have this conflict between Christ and Satan. You remember that? And he goes, they go three rounds, and Jesus does a, puts a knockout on them. They go three rounds. In the last round, everything's up for grab. And you recall that Satan says to him, listen to what he says to him in this passage. You can read it later. He says, if you will bow down and worship me. If you will surrender your sword. It says bow down. Make me divine delegated authority. If you will bow down and surrender your sword. Give up that word of God. Don't take that word of God serious. If you will bow down, give up that sword, the spirit of the truth of the word of God, and come worship me. I will give you the kingdom without dying. <laughs> you think he was going to give him anything? You do know he's a liar, don't you? He's a liar. He's the father of lies. He's a liar. A liar is pants on fire. He's a liar. Don't you listen to him tell you stuff. The Bible says this is what is the truth. Don't be listening to that foolishness. You know why? Because of what he wants you to do is bow down. First, you have to give up the sword. You have to give up the word of God that is truth. That's the only thing that can build faith in your life and, and meet the God that has a destiny designed for your life. I know. I know you think I'm nuts and you're right. I know that. 
Jesus said to him, I surrender nothing to you, you big bag of wind. There's not a, there's not, there's not a bone of truth in you. And he shouts, Worship God! Worship God! And serve Him only. You know what the devil did? Put his tail between his legs and ran away. Hoo-ah. Never surrender your sword. It's the only thing that can, that can win the victory. Never give up the word of God you have in your soul. Don't go out there and buy these lies and that goody stuff. Don't do that. Don't do that. Never surrender your sword. If you bow, you will worship the wrong thing. Yeah, well. You see, they did two things when they came to Christ. They bowed down and they worshiped him. Let me tell you, that's given it all. I mean, devil knows. Devil knew it when he told Jesus, bow down and worship. He knew what he meant by bow down. So did Jesus. Boy, you better know it. Who you kneel before. Listen, there is no other name that you bow your knee to. Well, this word is a very interesting word and in how it's used. And I've given you, you want it, listen, you want to take this word and every time you, do you see where I have take Matthew 2, 2, 8, and let me, I bold printed it? See that bold print? Do you see, do you see Matthew 14, 33? I bold printed it. When I do that, you want to go read that. And do you see Matthew 28, 9 through 17? You want to read that. You want to read that stuff. Because I'm showing you this in the dynamics of life of people. Because I know I don't have the time to do it. Our lesson text is using pros, uh, cuneo, is using it with the Eastern Gentile magi, uh, magi who have come to worship the newborn king. It is also used with Herod. But Herod's a liar, a deceiver, works, he works for the devil. He's bought into what Jesus didn't buy into, Herod did. And he tells them, oh, listen, when you find him, you come back and tell me because I want to come worship him too. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, I don't know how many guys, I don't know how many times girls have led guys in here the guys will say, "You said, well, you got to come and you've got to come and study with us at church, and let me, you know, yeah." yeah. And they call, "Oh yeah, you bet you, honey. I'll be right there with my boat, my 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 pen and pencil and and Bible." And they endure it as long as it takes to get you to put a ring on. And then you never see them again. Never see him again. How about that? Because they got some place they'd like to take you that's better than where you are right now. Careful how you bow down and what you worship. Let me tell you, this game's still going on. The devil's running that scam, Bubba. He's running this scam big time. You be careful what you got. Be careful what you got. Be careful what you got. The Magi wanted to know where, now they know who. See, their where went to who? Went to Jesus, didn't it? Went to Jesus. Well, Herod, as I mentioned, he said, I want to worship. The Magi said, we do and then the angel had, listen, they were intended to go back and tell him where because they thought he was serious. And God intervened in a dream to him and said, don't go back to Herod. He's not earning a fruitcake at Christmas. And they snuck out a dodge. And boy, did it burn him to a crisp. 
And don't you know a lot of heads rolled that day in security of the nation? Huh? Don't you know a lot of heads rolled when the Magi got out of town and nobody knew it? Listen, Herod the Great had one of the greatest security systems on his border that could have ever been invented. Build a wall. Listen, God is greater than all that stuff. God is greater than all that stuff. You understand that? He, he snuck them out by a cloud at night. Fire by day. You know, God can do this stuff. You do know that. We never trust him with any of it. Don't many, how many times he's done it? He slipped them out of one of the great all-time security border systems that you could have ever had in the ancient world. Slipped him right out by night, and he never even knew it. Ain't God wonderful? Ain't God wonderful? He'd do the same for you. He'd do the same for you. It's based on his word. He, his word appears to them, and they believe it, and they're safe. Can I tell you that? Let's have prayer. Father, we're so thankful for this time together. We close out our first half of this message, and we'll come back the second half, Father, to explain more about the gift of worship. I pray today, Father, as we open our hearts and give to our treasures that it's not done by law, it's done by grace. Out of, a, out of an exceedingly rejoicing heart full of great grace. We bring what we have to you, Father, in appreciation of all that you've given us. Sometimes, Father, the widow might doesn't look much to us. We need to have a different attitude. Our attitude is God wants a cheerful heart. He wants the heart of the gift. He wants the heart of the giver. The heart. Whatever treasures you open and give, be honored. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, the Magi. We're talking about the Magi, their special gift of worship. What a breakthrough in their life. With verse 2, they came to worship. They had an idea in their mind what that meant from their own culture, their own background. But this was such an adventure in their life that you can see how it changed because they combined this idea of bowing to worship that shows this whole thing that we discussed in the first hour. Today we're going to take, in the second part of this lesson, we're going to look at the star of Jesus. One of the great questions that, when I first heard this story, I went, well, when did God put that star up there? And uh, I believe he put it up there when he created stars. Uh, on the fourth day of creation, I believe that star was put there. Um, this special star, when God hung the stars in the expanse, he assigned a special star just for the birth of his son. The sovereignty of God caused the king star to appear in his galaxy simultaneously with the birth of Christ as a sign. Now, pay attention to that word sign. As a sign to the Gentile magis. And boy, they had it right because Herod wanted to know the exact time. Remember, we talked about that. When the birth of Christ took place and he, be, he was sure to get the exact time, he interrogated them on that issue. So... I mean, I think that star was there, in, and I believe it because of Genesis 1.14 when talking about, talking about the celestial creation on the fourth day. It says that God created the celestials for signs, for seasons, for days and years. And one of the big things with this star of the celestials was to the magi was the sign. A sign. And I believe that it was established there. Uh, the star was established on the fourth day of creation. And you can see this, uh, the way the sovereignty of God works in the scripture. Just a little bit about stars. That the, we could do a lot of study on stars. But for one, where, we, where he introduces them to us about stars for signs, for seasons, for days, for years. Calendars. Seasons, you know, we're so, I mean, we, we're so crazy about seasons and everything. We think there's global this and global that. Forget global. I mean, how about thinking God instead of global? Just think God, and all this crazy enough will stop. But for signs, for seasons, for days, for years, I mean, all of that came out of this. And then in Psalms 147.4, and, uh, and a great deal in the book of, of Job, for example, uh, deals with stars and uh, galaxies. Uh, and, uh, but he, in Psalms it says, and you're familiar with this, but it says he counts the number of stars. Think about that. I mean, way ahead of computers. Okay, way ahead of them. He counts the number of stars and, listen, gives names to all of them. So it doesn't surprise us that he has them names and that he can reveal that name to people. Hmm? That's background to this. And I was thinking, as I wrote that down, I was thinking, if we really understand that and was to believe that, why would we doubt and fret about our petty lives? We, f we just get so bent out of shape over the silliest things. I was talking to somebody the other day. They were in a, they were in a huge marital conflict over a wrinkled shirt. No appreciation at all for the fact they had a shirt. I mean, why not just be thankful you have a shirt? But no, we can't get that. We're not satisfied unless it's 
iron just the way we want it. You know what my mother would say? Iron it yourself. <laughs> That's my mama. You don't like the shirt? Oh, except my mother would go one step further. My mother would say, you don't like the way the shirt is ironed, Ron? Uh-uh. She would throw that one in the trash. Then go buy your own and iron it. I never told my mother I didn't like the meal she had because she picked a plate up and threw it in the garbage and said, then cook your own. I had a tough mama. I'm not recommending this way of life. I'm just... <laughs> I am not recommending that. I am not recommending that. I'm just telling you, there are people that... So Herod, you know what's interesting about Herod? Now listen to me. Herod is a descendant of Esau. He's an Edomite. He's not Jew. He's not Jew. You know, Jacob had twins. In Genesis 25, he had twins, Esau and Jacob. And I'm going to tell you, this is so dramatic. In the days of Herod, oh, you're missing this. I'm about to get happy feet. You're missing this. In the days of Herod, go to Numbers 24. Let me show you something. In Balaam's, this Gentile prophet out of this same group, Numbers 24, let me show you something really interesting that brings, and this is the Magi are showing up off from Balaam's fourth oracle. Numbers 24, this is Jacob's star, according to Balaam, oracle. But I want to show you something that's really interesting. That Now, see the star of Jacob is in verse 17. This is the star they saw. I see, this is Balaam now who is part of this group. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob. A sepulchre shall rise from Israel and soon crush through the forehead of Moab. See, you really have to understand the background to who Balaam and, and ba uh, uh, Balak. The, you have to know the background to that, that to be important. But listen, look at verse 18. But see, this is talking about, this is the star of Jacob. This is what the Magi are going by. This is why they're showing up in Jerusalem. Um, watch this. Edom shall be a possession. Sarah's enemies also be, shall be a possession, while Israel perfor performs valiantly. Edom. Edom is contrast in verse 18 to verse 19 in regard to the star of Jacob, who is Jesus Christ. From Jacob shall have dominion. One from Jacob shall have dominion. You know, that was prophetic when the kids were born. That was, that's, this is a prophetic idea. And shall destroy the remnants of the city. Look, what you have when the Magi show up off from this oracle, the fourth oracle of Balaam out of five, four out of five, this, was, this is the one that the Magi saw the star of Jacob that realized it was going to be the king of Israel, a sepulchre, a ruler of Jacob, and would be in conflict with Edom. Isn't that interesting? That is just, I mean, the word of God is so exciting to be able to see that kind of stuff, to be able to see it. So, look, we have King Herod, who is an Edomite who's at war with Jacob, Jacob's descendant, who is Christ, who is going to be the ruler. Listen, he, put, he, he, he tries to murder him. Do you understand that? All that, listen to me, why that's important. All that's part of this fourth oracle of where the star is that these guys have got. And it's playing out in history. Edom, Herod, against Jacob, uh, Jesus Christ. Do you not see that war? Yes. Oh, yeah. And listen, this is, this is Balaam. This is, this is Balaam. This is 
the time of Moses, numbers, this time of Moses, we're talking about the 15th century B.C., right? Balaam. He was during the he was during the period of 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 Mo, he would, Balaam showed up right at the end of Moses' life, if I remember right. Now look, my point my point this morning, if for no other point for you to get, is to be sure. Listen, we fret about such of the mi- most minute things. We just get bent out of shape. But listen, we know that's not what it is. Those are symbols. When you get upset over an iron shirt, we know it's not a shirt, nor is it iron, nor is it a wrinkle. We know that that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's just something that blew off, that something's bigger underneath it. We know that. We know that. But what is going on in your life when you get so bent out of shape over some of the, the most silly, goofy things? What is going on? There's much more going on. Why don't you resolve it? This is not what the issue is. It's what's down in your gut that you're all torn up over. Get down in there and work that out. It's not the wrinkled shirt. It's whatever's going on in your marriage or family or your life. What's going on? What's down in your gut? If you go to a psychologist, he's going to reach down and try to grab what's in your gut. Tell me what you're really feeling. He's talking about what we used to call your gut. What is your gut feeling? What are, those, what are those interlocking secrets that you can't tell other people that you need to speak it out? You need to address it. Because that inner dialogue is where it's at. You know what it is. You bury it and hope it'll go away, and it never does. It never does. So here we are. He, at Romans 4.21, listen, it says, being fully assured... I can't tell you how important that is. Being fully assured. I mean, that's the, that's the top of confidence, isn't it? Being fully assured. Are you fully assured the person you're going to marry, this person you're going to stay with the rest of your life? Are you fully assured that you're willing to go the distance? This is not going to be a one-nighter. If you're looking for a one-nighter, this is not it. You ready to go? Listen, what about your job? What about your ministry? What about this? What about that? Listen, being fully assured that what God has promised, He's able to perform. Listen, what He's promised. It's not what you've asked for, it's what he's promised. You get, your expectations get all wacky. Give them up and get into the word of God. Let your expectation be the will of God. Because listen, when your expectation is the will of God, he's obligated himself to do it. He ain't obligated to do what you tell him. He's obligated to do what he's told you he will do. And sometimes we get all that confused. So Jail, uh, Balaam's fourth. Now listen, where's Balaam from? Well, if you study the Bible about Balaam, you will find that he, he's from a little town, uh, Pector, that's on the Euphrates River in Mesopotamia. He's, a, he's from Mesopotamia. He is from the same region of where Abraham, out of there where the Chaldees came, is in the lower part. Only God puts this stuff together, people. Nobody can put this kind of st- Nobody could write the drama of your life like God, and you need to know that God is writing the drama of your life, and you need to be sure that you're letting God carry you down where you're going. You be sure that where you're moving in your decision-making is where God wants you to be. We call that the directive will of God. So... Balaam, he, he does this fourth of five. Uh, did, I, did I write on your, I'm at point four. Did I write on your paper Deuteronomy 23, four and five? Or, or write that down if you want to know where he's from. Deuteronomy 23, four and five. Deuteronomy 23, four and five. 
the fourth oracle of five, prophesied the appearance of Jacob's star in the east to announce the birth of the king of the Jews. This is during the time of, of Moses. And you can, I've given you places you can read about it. We read earlier in Numbers 24, 17, and I remind you, I see him, but not now. Where, how did he see him then? <laughs> By faith. By vision, for sure. I see him, but not now. But, but that's kind of the way we feel about the second coming. You know, it used to bother me when I was an unbeliever. I would meet these people. They were just absolutely sold out for Jesus Christ. I said, how can that be? You've never met him. This guy died 2,000 years ago. How is it that you can base all your decisions and make all these, all these ideas and I'm going to be this and I'm going to be that. How can you do that with somebody who's died? And listen, even if he, quote, rose from the dead, as you declare, nobody has seen him. How are you making all these decisions? Who am I going to marry? What kind of job am I going to have? Where am I going to work? Why am I going to do this? Why that? Every day we're making decisions. How is it possible that your life is being directed by somebody you've never met, you don't know? You know what the difference is? When you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, when you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, he changes you from the inside out, not from the outside in. That's called transformation. And he does a magnificent thing. He gives you Colossians 1, 26, 27. It's worth looking. It is worth looking because this is how this works. Colossians 1, 26, 27. The mystery which has been hidden from past ages and generations. See, I knew it was a mystery, but I thought it was a stupid idea. I didn't know that God called it a mystery. It was certainly a mystery. If somebody said, well, that's a mystery, and I said, yeah, it sure is. But I just call it stupid. All right. The mystery which has been hidden, watch, watch for the mystery now. The mystery which has been hidden from past ages and generations like this one we're talking about, but now has been manifested to his saints. Here it is. To whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Come on, Magi. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Whoa. Christ in you, not in a manger, not in a house. Whoa, in you. Come on now. There's the mystery of transformational living. Not Christ in a house, not Christ in a manger, not Christ in Jerusalem, not Christ in Bethlehem. Christ at home in my heart. He's got my address on him, baby. He's got my address. I don't have his address. He's got mine. Whoa. Joy to the world. If that doesn't excite your... Well. So I gave you some things. People, when they read Micah 2.5, they think of Bethlehem, and rightly so. But you ought to think also of a ruler that's going to be born in Bethlehem. A ruler of the Jew, the Messiah, is going to be. He's called the ruler. We miss that sometimes. Do you know that Balaam is talked a great deal about in the New Covenant? For example, in 2 Peter 2.15, in Jude 11, to the church at per Pergamos, in um, Revelation 2.14, and you know what he's identified with? False teaching. Not because he gave out this, the, the five oracles, because he chose in the end 
to go against what God told them not to do and pronounced a curse upon Israel, and it was a curse that boomeranged. It eat his lunch before the day was over, like it does in all of our lives. That's kind of interesting. This guy, this guy had a, a stellar career connected with the Messiah and threw it away for a, 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 a bowl of soup. Apparently it had some of Suzanne's. That's about as close as you can get to throwing away something for it. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob. A sepulcher shall rise from Israel. And the Magi are part of this wonderful historical event. Let me conclude our service today. The next guy I want to mention. Now, there are many I could have talked about. Don talked to me at halftime. How about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Yeah, what about them? I mean, who could even talk about these guys without fainting? I mean, there's so many. I just picked out a few because I only have a little bit of time. <clears throat> but Daniel, because I'm telling you the links that got the Magi to where they went, the star, the creative star that God hung out there for his son. This star was for his son, and when at the right time, the sovereignty of God, he just turned it on. He lit the star. The Magi went, Cha -cha! and the rest is history. And then Balaam comes along, gets this idea. Then Daniel, Daniel, oh, Daniel knocked it out of the park with these guys. Can you imagine this? I mean, Joseph and Daniel are so alike in many ways in the prophetic plan of God. They're both part of this group. Both had this. They Listen, God revealed to them, oh, listen to me. We're such privileged people. We have no clue how fortunate we are. These two guys, God revealed the mystery before, before people knew it was a mystery. He revealed the mystery to these guys. He did, he did to Joseph. He did to Daniel. He did to many, but... He revealed the mystery. You and I, we get it. There it is. Every believer, not just, not just somebody that's ten times wiser than anybody else gets it, or somebody like Joseph. Listen, do you know that both these guys, Joseph wound up second in command of Egypt, and do you know Daniel wound up third? <laughs> oh, you talk about promotions, man. And they did it with Gentile believers. People of the world saw the power and wisdom of God in these people and just promoted them. They went nuts for these people. And you, you grumble and gripe about your little old job and you're not getting anywhere and you're stuck somewhere. And you, let your light shine. Let your light shine. Listen, let your light shine. He might make you president of where you are. You're just cleaning the bathrooms right now. He may have CEO written all over you. How do you know? Let your light shine. Daniel 1.24, Every matter of wisdom and understanding about which a queen, the king consulted them, he found them ten times. <laughs> ten times. They kept count. Who, who, who would have thought? It's their predictability. It's predictability, kind of like voting on ball games. Ten times smarter, ten times wiser. There's more of that information in the book of Daniel. Daniel brought the, re listen, this is what Daniel brought that's so important. It's what I'm trying to bring today. Daniel brought the revelation of the word of God as scriptures to this group of intellects. <laughs> he gave them, he gave them scriptural evidence of what they were talking about. That's what he brought. Listen, this was a, a slave guy. Listen, they drug him out of his home by military force, drug him through the streets, drug him off. He was a captive. He was a POW. 
and worked his way by the grace of God, through the grace of God, worked himself third ranked in the nation. Let me tell you, you talk about Babylon, you're talking quite, quite a power power. You're talking about somebody pretty big. Egypt, when Joseph became second in command of Egypt, they were bigger in life. <laughs> they dominated everything. They dominated, they dominated intellect. They dominated everything. So, so did Babylon when he went up the ranks. He brought them the revelation of the word of God. Listen to, why, listen, listen to how he would address the king. Would king would bring him in and say, I got something. Uh, I can't, nobody, nobody in the kingdom. I got, I got, they're called the wise men. They're the devil's group. I can't get none of them. I got them all together. They can't, I got nothing. What you got, son? Listen, here's a guy who had to learn a whole nother language and culture a way of doing things. Let me tell you, Babylon didn't change for you. <laughs> no more than did Rome or Greece or anybody, Persians or anybody else. They did, not, you, they did not cater to your whims. You catered to theirs. That's, listen to how, this, is, this, is, this was Daniel's standard message. O oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. The latter days. Do you know what, how we interpret that now? Second coming. We interpret that whole thing on the second coming. The latter days is truly the latter days. Christ has to come to come again. I mean, that... Daniel, Daniel, got that, got that. I can't get some of you to get it. The latter days. <laughs> Listen, we live, in this, we live in the power of these days when we have the mystery of godliness. The mystery of godliness. We don't even know what it is. We, we have the mystery of godliness. 1 Timothy 3.16 this is the dream and the vision in your mind while on bed, he told Cain. Now listen, when you get to the fifth chapter, and I'm going to close. When you get to the fifth chapter of Daniel and you read verses 1 through 6, it says that the king and his courts drank out of the golden goblet from the Jewish temple. Part of the treasures brought back to the king of the Jews. They rightly belong to the king of the Jews and they brought resemblance. They brought tokens from their life and from what had been stolen by Babylon from them brought them back as as a as a uh, a, uh, a a kind of a pledge an honor these belong to him this is the king that these belong to and they brought back the things that they thought this king of the Jews, not just not any king. They didn't bring just the gifts of any king. They brought the gifts that they thought that the king of the Jew would most respect from Babylon. From the Mesopotamia place. Well, listen, and I close with this. The Magi, this was the day, this was the day of all days. Do you know do you know you could live a long time and never be able to see a fulfillment like this in your lifetime as a magi? Kind of like the shepherds? Kind of like uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth in the priesthood? You could, you could and never have that right timing and the plan of God for all that stuff to come together? And this was quite a magical day in their life about worship, how worship, how the object of your worship, the object of what you worship is so important. This is what they discovered. It's not the where, it's the who. It's not the where, it's not the where, it's the who. And this was a, this was a breakthrough in their life. It should be for you. It's, it's not where, it's who. It's who. Now listen, I thought about this coming in this morning to church. 
I thought, imagine the shock of these guys 30 years later, 34 years later, whatever, when they hear that Israel has murdered their king that they came to worship, that a special star had been hung in a sky with his name on it. And this group of people have murdered the king of the Jews. But you and I know that was a murder. That was a supreme offering for our salvation. That was a gift of grace. For by grace we are saved through faith and not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. If there is ever a gift for any Christmas of your life, it's certainly the gift of Jesus Christ. That's what that star was all about. That's what that 300-mile trip was all about. That's what true worship is all about. Don't be a nod to God group. Believe that Jesus came to die on that cross for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day to give you everlasting life so that you can be a part of his life, not, not in just the forever, but in the now of the ever. Father, we're so thankful today for these who have come our way to study with us both by automobile and internet. And I pray, Father, we would pay attention. The object of, of what we worship will dominate our heart. Jesus said in Matthew, the 6th chapter, 19 through 21, the treasure in the heart. The treasure in the heart. It needs to be the heavenly treasure, not the earthly one. The heavenly one, not the earthly one. Not the earthly one. May we, may we open our treasures. May we take a good look at what we got. Are they honorable to the Lord? You've got to open your heart before you can open your treasures. And when you do, you'll see how the treasures are important to how they work together and not against each other. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.